Welcome to Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Brad Factor. Brad is the founder and CEO of EctoVR. They're a company that makes uh, basically shoes that have wheels on the bottom and will sort of keep you in position while you're in a VR situation. Uh, Brad, welcome to the pod. Thanks, Spencer. Glad to be here. Glad to have you. Yeah. I, uh, I've been wanting to do this for a while, so I appreciate you making the time. Yeah, it's been uh, a month or two or a year or two that we've been talking about some stuff here. Yeah, well, the but, podcast has only been around for a year. And, right. And now you're one of the people I know that's doing interesting things in town. So. Yeah, yeah. No, happy to be here. It's good chat. And uh, I, I like the product pitch. You know, uh, I like to say you, you put our, our boots on over your shoes, you put on a VR headset, you walk, you feel like you're in whatever virtual world, uh, you know, it could be a game, could be a tourist experience, could be industrial training, but you're staying in a 10 by 10 foot room the whole time. So it's like the opposite of Swift Robotics. Yeah, so, <laughs> what, I mean, Junji and I were, that, that's actually part of our pivot from a mobile robots platform to a wearable was nice. Chris Atkinson, uh advised both of us. I did and, not know that. Yeah. And he's like, hey, I'm advising this guy, Shinji. Uh, you should talk to him. So the, the joke ever since then has been, he makes robots to go this way, and I make robots to go this way. <laughs> nice. <laughs> it works. I mean, it's, yeah, yeah, it's very, you guys converged on it, sort of similar. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Far cry from rumors on steroids, but uh, yeah. you know, now people are actually walking on them. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, those things were uh, were pretty fun. I tried them at Discovery Day. Just speaking of shift for a second, mm -hmm. I um, I feel like I didn't really get over the learning curve. I had about five minutes on them, and I'm still was like tripping over myself by the end. I, hmm. I so for me, I think it's because I've seen robots go wrong every single way, and and I I know there's a lot of money into that product, and it's probably rock solid, but I'm still terrified it's going to break and, and hurt me. Yep. So I think that was where my nervousness came from. <laughs> no, that's fair. I mean, we. At, at Ecto, we put a lot of time, effort, money into, you know, being very safe and trying to go slower than people will want to push us. You know, it's just, hey, just get that out there. Just whatever works. Like, no, hold on, guys. This needs to be safe. And to your point, like, people are going to naturally either be like, hey, I'm just going for it or realistically trepidatious of trying something completely new and understanding how to kind of bridge those two worlds yeah, has been sense. really important to our, our design process. All right, so that's a good place to start. I like, what are some of the ways that you've sort of approached the safety piece and then just people's apprehension or maybe over-enthusiasm with the project where you're like, dude, come on, slow down. <laughs> like, don't, don't hurt yourself, uh, you know. Yeah. How, do you, how do you broach that or, or like, you know, what are your ways around that? Yeah, no, it's it's definitely one of the the challenges. I mean, so my, with my background in uh, flight control systems, like you're you're talking about stuff where events have to happen, you know, ten to the minus twelve. So one in you know how, however many billions of flight hours, maybe this happens. And but if it happens, it's catastrophic, right? Now we in a what will be a consumer product, we can't hit that level. But like a lot of the design philosophy there of understanding, you know what. What are your failure points? What are the assumptions that users are going to make? Like, how can you test something that's going to be more dangerous to validate it until it's safer? And what do you have to put around that? And that can be as simple as, you know, people wearing helmets, people wearing knee pads. We've actually built a whole uh, testing setup that when we're doing like really prototypical stuff, uh, like if something goes wrong, we hit an e-stop. It's like a harness system, holds the person in place, the boots stop, everything oh, cool. is just, yeah. So it helps so us- like a cat one? Uh, I mean, it, so it's it's four dog leashes attached to a, <laughs> an aluminum <laughs> display truss with solenoids. It, it is a- <laughs> Solenoids, what do the solenoids do? To, to lock the, the leashes. Oh, nice. So normally, <laughs> right, so you, you know, you're you held in place. Wherever you are. But I mean, that's that's for testing stuff that we wouldn't put out in public, right? That's and I all take for it those are probably normally uh, closed, and you release them to test, and then power de-energized as they lock. Actually, I'm trying to remember if they're normally open or normally closed, but uh, it's it's controlled by the the embedded system that's attached to the computer. But, cool. I mean, that, that that's just an example of you know how we've 
de-risk known safety risk when we're testing things that you know we haven't tested the software before we haven't tested this hardware before it's not something that we're putting on a user around the world G doesn't have that luxury because they're trying to make people move fast <laughs> <laughs> treadmill maybe treadmill yeah, <laughs> but you know starting kind of from there but progressively validating de-risking things to the point that you then have a solid lockdown demo. You say, you know, this software has been validated internally, externally. It's been unit test, system test. I mean, you, your systems engineering background, all the work that you do. Yeah, you, we went to the same yeah, masters. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you know how to, to stage this through. But, I mean, that gets you to the point where you can say, like, this has been tested and validated. You are a new, naive user guest participant come on, try it out, it'll be safe. Yeah. Now, to your point about the enthusiasm, there's a lot of people that, from like a backing perspective, want to push you to say, oh, well, you're still validating the internal thing, just get that out into the world. And you know, people will say- Is there like investors that'll try to- I mean, the, there's definitely a push from the investment side uh, at times, from a partner side as well. I mean, as an example, like, we used to have a 30 minute demo because we had a, a training process for a user. So yeah. we, way back when we would put people straight into VR in the boots and they just didn't have enough context to be comfortable to your point of trepidation. Like they didn't know what was going on in their feet. Yeah, makes sense. Like wh why am I gonna, <laughs> now you're putting this headset on me. I, I don't know what's going on. Omnidirectional, I know that was like a thing for yeah. a while. Okay, yeah. that's pretty cool. Omnidirectional, the wired, don't do that. Ba battery powered, wireless <laughs> battery powered, all, all good things. Nice. Um, but yeah, so we, we had the, we went the other way. We started people outside of VR first. We're like, okay, you're going to walk on these things. It's going to be like walking on an omnidirectional treadmill, but it's on your feet. Who the fuck has used an omnidirectional treadmill? <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're in a see, research lab. See, but you, you can say treadmill and people are like, ah, and you're like omnidirectional. And if you're in a robotics crowd, people go, ah, and otherwise they'll go, ah. What does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean, right? <laughs> or they'll just move past it. But do there exist omnidirectional treadmills? Like there must. There do. There do. Uh, how yeah. do you build that? Like, sorry, this is very off in the weeds. Oh, but... it's it's related. So I mean, uh, as an example, Infinidec, Omnifinity, those are two of the like existing uh, omnidirectional VR treadmills. Uh, Cyberwalk so was a project. In a large sense, yeah, yeah. But also, you could use them to test. Junji's product on, not yours. <laughs> so I, I tried an Infinidec uh, yeah. back in 2018. I have not tried an Omnifinity, although I have seen a very, th there was a very cool uh, Battlefield 3 simulation that they did with it where it wasn't VR, it was projected surrounded oh, that's display. Cool. And they added in the uh, immersive firearm aspect of it with uh, paintball guns. Oh, cool. <laughs> so you're, so you're on an omnidirectional treadmill inside of this display tent getting shot at by paintball gun. Oh, that's wild. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, yes. Uh, that's hilarious. But, but, but coming back to the training point, right? <laughs> so, you, you know, we, we were doing a, like a 30-minute experience where the yeah. first five minutes is getting people in the gear then 10 minutes running them through like different training scenarios to build confidence and then getting into the experience. And we would have people be like, no, no, I've got, look, I've got five minutes for this. I need the five minute experience. And we had to say, you know, I'm sorry, this isn't safe unless we take you through this whole thing. Yeah. Now we don't have to do the demo. It's fine. Won't be insulted. You can watch somebody else do a demo if that works. But if we're doing it, it's going to take this whole time. And, I mean, How many people like opted to do it at that point? Everybody. Nice. No, nobody said, eh, not, not going to do it. <laughs> it's awesome. Like, all right, fine. <laughs> Cancel my 2 o'clock Agnes. <laughs> Clear my schedule. Now, now, all the experience that we've had going to trade shows, building newer versions of the product, like all of that has gotten us to the point, and it was really exciting with PR and Discovery Day, we were putting people straight into VR with cool. no training beforehand. I'm sad I didn't get to see that demo. I, I was stuck at our fucking booth. <laughs> <laughs> so you you might have been doing an important fun. thing or two. I don't, I don't yeah. know. No, it was, I, it I owe you a demo. Though. Oh, yeah. I'll take you up on that for sure. <laughs> but uh, in January, maybe, maybe that. Right, right. No, I, I mean, I, I promised a, an office tour. Yeah. There are boots in the office. I, I, th I think we can make this work. <laughs> That'd be a lot of fun. But, uh, yeah, I mean, we went to doing straight into VR, 
No training. If we do it sooner, we could splice in the video. <laughs> <laughs> right? I was trying to talk weasel my way in. <laughs> so. we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we, we cut the demo time down to 11 minutes, and we've actually set it up so people can be on deck because uh, some of the work we're doing needs to have like higher throughput. Because when you say on, so you mean you're onboarding one person or the next person's? Yeah, so cool. two two kits of boots. You're putting the boots on one person while the other person's having the experience. They finish their experience. This person hops up, you walks have to swap out. Swap batteries to be able to turn them around that quickly. Uh, so I mean, they they use currently off the shelf Makita tool batteries. Oh, sweet! So That's a good get. <laughs> swapping is pretty easy. That's awesome. <laughs> you get. Uh, hour to two hours of runtime on them nice. so you can do multiple demos i love makita too like all my power tools in makita that's <laughs> I, I i already got the equipment i should just buy ecto vr equipment now and just right? complete the setup so, so that's the that's the funny thing with our equipment is that we intentionally bought not makita so that we didn't accidentally take batteries from the boots and put them on something else you know what's wrong with running boot batteries in your power tools uh, just from like a controlling how many cycles oh, go through. Got it. Yeah, makes you know, sense. if you if you cycle it a whole bunch on your power drill and then you put it back on your boot and you're like, yeah, that doesn't seem to be running quite as uh, <laughs> strong as it used to, or vice versa. Yeah, right? that makes a lot so, of sense. Yeah. <laughs> when I've definitely destroyed Makita drill batteries just over years of abuse. And so. They're rated for like a hundred cycles. Oh yeah, <laughs> they're meant to be destroyed at that point. <laughs> <laughs> so. I think I, it's a hundred cycles, but yeah, they're you, good for like ten thousand. How do you track that? Like in, in make sure you pull them out before they hurt someone or do you just have like a voltage indicator that won't let you run it if it's too low? Yeah, so we uh, we, we do look at the, the nominal, the operating voltage. Yeah, there's there's like a, a set point to start it. To That's how you that find we've... out. And I... If you try to pull some current and it dips down, you know you're kind of screwed out of the gate. Yeah, I, I mean that... To your point of safety, like that's also a thing, uh, like from a chemistry perspective, right? We'd love to be able to use lithium polymer batteries. We'll probably look at other battery chemistries as we go towards the like custom version for consumer products. But lithium ion in a tool, like a tool battery, is a really safe yeah. battery compared to a lot of other options out I've there. I've never seen a lithium ion battery in a power tool catch fire. I have seen lithium polymer batteries in robots catch fire. Right. Yep, I, I'm thinking of a couple videos that circulated around the RI. Uh, With the planetarium? It might have been that one. I think there was one on JPL, too. Can you you should send me that. I'm doing a talk on mm. uh, Robots Gone Wild, and I feel like that would be good for it. I'll, I'll dig it up. I think yeah. I think this was a Chris Atkinson special as well. That's he awesome. uh, he walked into class Chuck one day. He was kind of griping to me because he had to spend 35 grand to replace the HEPA filters in the planetary box high bay <laughs> after a lipo fire. Yep, uh, that's not what you want. <laughs> yeah, HEPA filters are expensive. I heard another story. I won't say where it was from, but there was a hospital where somebody cheaped out and like didn't want to replace the HEPA filters in the in the OR. Mm. And I think I think I might be wrong on this. So I'm not like a big pumps and fans guy, but the anecdote goes something along the lines of like when you put your hand over a vacuum. Do you think it's working harder or less hard? Mm. <laughs> and, and now we start and getting answer, into like course, column height and. Uh... I believe is that it's working harder. Sorry, less hard when your hands over it, because because the flow is decreased. I think so. Right. So I think it's just able to free spin and and like it reaches this point where it just kind of goes. And so apparently the story that I heard was that in this hospital. They, um, it's less hard when your hands on it. <laughs> Interesting. Well, I mean, the physics have to work out whichever way makes this story more interesting. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> so that's that's what I'm working out in my head. Yeah. So if it's less hard when your hands on it. That means it's harder when your hands off it, which means, okay. So I, I think I remember what happened now. So basically, this hospital maintenance crew had run these HEPA filters through their life and they were looking at a um, six figure replacement budget and they didn't have the money uh, in their budget and nobody wanted to get it. And so they took the filters out <laughs> and they were tripping breakers mm. because all of a sudden um, the thing was the, working the harder because was... it had full flow. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And so um, hmm. they brought in a colleague of mine to look at it and um, the uh, 
they kept tripping breakers. Like, why are we tripping breakers? And my colleague looked around and he or she said, um, what are you doing? You need to have HEPA filters in an operating room. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, right. you need to address this immediately. Like this is a lawsuit waiting to happen. Yeah, I, mean, I can't gives. imagine. Yeah, that, that that sounds very similar to the uh, the the qualifying. I mean, it, you know, not having HEPA filters in the operating room. Like to your point, that's a lawsuit. But it, it feels very similar to yeah. the NASA space shuttle wind, like the cockpit windshield validation. Do you, oh, tell uh, me about this. I don't know this one yet. It, so uh, you know, they, they have to qualify it against bird strike. Is this and the frozen? Uh, okay, know <laughs> you know this one. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, it was turkey. Was it turkeys? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah frozen turkeys. I'm trying to remember if it's chicken or turkey because they're they shooting frozen turkeys out of an air cannon. Yeah, I heard it. yeah, and then they're they're firing them at the at the windshield and it keeps breaking and they're just like they're bringing in the expert and the expert's just like, gentlemen, thaw your turkeys. <laughs> <laughs> Like what? What kind of turkey or uh, turkey or chicken are you hitting that is frozen? <laughs> this, this is the this is the fowl that flies at fifty thousand feet above your launch site. <laughs> it does it once. <laughs> about this. Just, just like the owl that turns its head three sixty. Wait. Once. <laughs> Yeah, um, you know, I mean, there might be some schmuck with an air cannon trying to hit your shuttle. Look, if they've got the angle to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have heard about, uh, I think I maybe heard a similar story where it was like um, jet engines that they were validating that mm. way, where they were shooting them into a jet engine. They, they were doing the, the ingestion test and it yeah. was just breaking up the turbine yeah, blades. Yeah, just destroying just, the turbine just, blades. Just, just shredding the, the compressor. Yeah. <laughs> I also saw, uh, I was um, having like some hookah with a guy from when I was right out of grad school, hmm. and he showed me a simulation of, <laughs> it was quad rotors flying into jet engines. Oh. I, it, was, it was hilarious. <laughs> I, I feel like that, that doesn't emulated. end well for anyone. No. <laughs> <laughs> they, that's what they were emulating, they were simulating. Yeah. All right, that's, a, that's quite the physics problem. It was pretty funny to watch. Was, was that like branded under multi multi body physics? This is why you buy the the extension for that. I think it was for a client. So um, I guess we worked in some of the same labs. So you were in the field robotics center. We saw each other there. Um, what yeah. were you working on there? Yeah, I mean that was. I've asked you about this sort of, but we never really. Right. Did. Right. I mean. Uh... So MRSD program, as you know, is just a, a bucket of everything robotics. Yep, they just kind of throw you right in the deep end. It's right, like swim, CV, fish. ML, controls, biomechanics, kinematics, dynamics, controls. Yep. You know, just, as much uh, technical word salad as I can pull out of here is probably underselling uh, what they expose you to MRSD. Yeah, that, sure. that might have been when we were doing our CV project. Because I, I think that's the most that we spent in the, the FRC High Bay was doing that. So what was the project? Can I ask you? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm frankly trying to remember some of the details. Like, 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 like any good uh, graduate or college level experience, you try to blank out as much of it as you can. Yeah, yeah. But, I thought uh, alcohol was the only way to get through mine. <laughs> well, I was just thinking of lack of sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that too. But I, I think it was a... It's a delicate balancing act between right? sleep deprivation and drinking. <laughs> Did they still have that robo-lounge when you were there where they just plied you with booze? I, I think yes is the, <laughs> is, is the answer. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> they just, I, I guess for, for people listening, they, they, the Graduate Student Association, I think it was, just just bought... All this alcohol, and, and they just they just fed it to us. We were coming to this program. They're like, you know, we know you had a hard week, but here's some booze. <laughs> I mean, all I can think about from that is that when we were back for the the tenth year of MRSD, I uh, was walking around showing Jen, my partner, the uh, around the RI, and we went past the Robo Lounge. <laughs> And there were two people in a spot costume. Wait, even, Boston Dynamics spot? Uh-huh. Yeah. It was just big yellow cardboard box. <laughs> two people sticking out of it. <laughs> they were in one of the, like... This the, was the, around Carnival, so this must have had to do with that. Right, right. And they were in one of the side rooms just off of the Robo Lounge. And we just looking at them and we're like, 
huh. <laughs> yeah. No, that fits right in. <laughs> and then they opened the door and went into the party. And they're like, yeah, keep, keep doing that, guys. He's awesome. doing a good job. <laughs> but yeah, so um, I don't know. What are the, some of the things that are coming up for Ecto? Like, what are some of the, how many, first of all, how many iterations of your device have you been to at this point? Because last I checked, it was maybe two years ago, and it had already been like four. So Yeah, I think we're up to seven. Nice. <laughs> yep. One and two uh, were, were wired, wall-powered, USB communication, unidirectional. How do you push the, um, the current you need to run those motors through the wall power? I mean, you have a big enough power... Battery, uh, you know, power supply on the other end. <laughs> but uh, you go higher voltage. Uh, no, I mean, uh, when, when you're not going omnidirectional and you know, you're doing kind of limited motion, like the the current you need to push through is is not horrible. So you've you've pushed past omnidirectional and you're no longer. No, no, I'm saying back on the. Oh, got it. Ba- back on the one that was all wired up. Like yeah. it, it was a, a pretty low low bar of what was functional. Yeah. Right, and then third one we started on me directional. I remember that. I think I came in at the fourth. Could, is could, where I worked with you at Innovation Works. Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> very few people walked in the third one, uh, <laughs> with reason. But uh, we got to the fourth one, and that was the one where we were doing. The uh, wheels were able to twist at demos. that point, right? Like it wasn't like Omni wheels. It was like. Yeah, no. The, so the third one, drive. the third one was Omni wheels. The fourth one it was the the start of our our differential swerve drive that uh, all of the designs have been based on since then. Oh, cool! And uh, that that was kind of like a almost like a sandal, or like a flip flop design. Yeah, I remember. And then we went from that to more of like a a multi hinged, so it flexes around oh, your cool. foot. Uh, That's and, awesome. Yeah. So we did a couple iterations on that, and then. Uh, we we released Directa DK1, which is what went to first customers and is in use today. Ecto Evo is the one that we just released uh, when we went to Dubai, Jitex. Nice. That was uh, quite quite the trip there. <laughs> <laughs> what was that like? It was it was a lot of work. I mean, it was like being at a like being at CES in Sony or Samsung's or whoever's big booth. Uh, we we partnered with Etis a lot. They're a multinational telecom. I think they're in like 160 countries, and uh, you know, they they brought us out there, put us into our booth. We were aside from the <laughs> flying car, we were the uh, the most popular thing in their uh, in their stand. What are, what's going on with the flying cars these days? Because I've seen a ton of hype, like right? pretty much since the 1960s, and popular mechanics on flying cars. Uh, the most that I've seen of it's it. the quadrotor like, one, right? That's like hot right now. Joby, Joby, something different. I'm trying to remember the name. What I do remember is that there were two different flying car companies there. I think it was Xpeng and another one. Oh, interesting. And I know Xpeng was a flying car. I should know this. No, I, I don't know if that's all they do. But yeah, uh, I knew they did ground autonomy. They they were doing a little little social media battle between each other, and one was like. Hey, we flew in Dubai. Are you guys flying in Dubai? <laughs> <laughs> I guess we are now, <laughs> right? I, I don't actually know how that uh, that ended up, but uh, <laughs> it was interesting to see that there. But uh, yeah, no, very uh, very busy time. Very educational. It'd be uh, really useful going forward to trade shows, which you know, we're we're working on our our DK two design. That'll be coming out in fingers crossed a few months and. Nice. Uh, Doing a little bit of investor road show and building up our, our beta partner program with the DK2. That's awesome. Guys. Got, yeah, thanks. Got uh, doing doing some work with uh, CMU's Entertainment Technology Center right now. Uh, they, are you familiar with the Building Virtual Worlds class? Uh, I mean, I know I'm going to have to. <laughs> not a ton, but let's talk about it. Yeah, so Randy Pausch. Uh, started this course I'm, I'm not the expert on it but it's really it's kind of like mit media lab but for cmu <sighs> kind of okay, yeah cool. yeah so they uh they started this course a while ago with the concept um that you like make a new experience multiple times through the semester so student these are professional graduate teams coming in to get their master's in entertainment technology and they build uh you know, it could be a mobile game, it could be a VR game, it could be a like built set experience, and 
they do this in like one week, two weeks, three weeks, ah, and it's to a prompt. It, it really isn't, but I have to say the team that used our boots in BVW, Building Virtual Worlds, because we're one of the platforms for the course this nice. semester, uh, they made this really, really awesome Yeti experience. Like so, the abominable snowman? Kind of like. That's cool. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so you put on the VR headset, and it's like you're at the North Pole. There's uh, you know northern lights above you. There's ice flows going out. And there's an ice cave out there. And you've got your Yeti girlfriend is, is out on the ice waiting for oh, you. So you're a Yeti. So you're a Yeti. Yeah, that's cool. And you look down, because we track where the boots are, you see these big, blue, hairy Yeti feet. Oh, but cool. they're your feet. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> so you walk out on the ice and you've got to like avoid the melting ice and not stay too long on the cracking ice. And uh, you know, it was built from the ground up to work with our Ecto-1 boots. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a relatively short experience, but it is, it is awesome. People do really interesting things. They'll take like big lunging steps or these weird like side steps. They're like, huh. I didn't, I didn't know the boots were going to handle that. <laughs> they handled it really well. They're still handling it really well. Okay. <laughs> nice. So it, it's... You running the dog leashes for that one? So that's, that's the terrifying but also awesome part of how we've deployed these <laughs> kits is that we expected to be sitting with them for a long time. And our, our first one, we went, we did a rental, and we were on site. We were running most of the demos with the client. Uh, we you know, trained them up as operators, watched them do a few, coached them through, but mostly we were, we were helping out. With uh, the purchase that came from that and what CMU's been doing, we dropped the kit off. We gave them a little bit of training, and we're just like, how much does your insurance cost? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently enough. <laughs> but yeah, we awesome. we uh, we drop like I said, we drop them off. We gave them training. We're we're there for support, right? We Slack, email, whatever they need. But it is nice. very much a you guys call us if you have a problem. Otherwise, have fun, enjoy, That's awesome. and it's gone really well. That's like, really cool. The, the I mean, that's the dream. You're yeah. into the realm of consumer product, or I guess business to business, but still. No, I mean, we're it's product. Tor towards heading to yeah. the consumer product, right? Because that's, that's the thing. You have to drop it into an unstructured environment where there's almost no control. It's going to, like, the spec varies wildly of what somebody's living room looks like. Yep. And the product's got to be okay in that. And this is. What if somebody puts, like. Step. I mean, there's got to be so many things to go about. Like, what if, like, a dog steps underneath one of the boots? Like, I mean, there's got to be a million edge cases. Uh, honestly, pets check. are pr pretty much the first thing that come up when you think about, okay, let's transition from, you know, being at a DOD contractor or a lab or a uh, university or a business, like, you know, a, an oil and gas company or mining company. Like, what, what changes when you go from their room to your room or yeah. my room or, or your room at home, right? Like, <laughs> and, and pets, like, it's, uh, I mean, let, let's oh, be honest. The, yeah, I, so the, the VR headset places. companies have to deal with this, and a lot of it's about mapping the environment, right? Yeah. So where where is my couch in here? Where is my chair? Where Where is my pet right now? Where is it now? You know, and, and understanding so you've got, that. like, fluffy detection on some level. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the, the boots yell at the dog move <laughs> move <You> dick <laughs> step aside <laughs> step aside <laughs> yeah that's funny yeah no it's uh, you know to to the point of safety like we we built it up to the point that we were comfortable doing that but like it's it has surpassed expectations in that way and it's it's awesome that we can uh, th there's always been a, a bit of a concern of well you know brad has to be there or oh, well, they're gonna have to babysit the boot so much like you couldn't you couldn't possibly just send it to somebody but we just here you go here's your training yeah yeah <laughs> i mean I, I guess i mean to be fair like hoverboards exist by the you know probably by the millions at this point 
I mean, that's at least as dangerous, <laughs> if not more so. Right. That was a that, that's a whole conversation we we're having about branding, right? And uh, yeah. you know, from well, like a knockoff perspective, you know, how how do you handle when somebody makes something? So segways exist by the tens of thousands. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Well, I mean, to, to the point of hoverboard, like, I mean, you know, airlines have said, oh, you can't have devices like this on there because you know, how many companies have to make ones that have exploding batteries where suddenly, oh, that's that's a big concern. And, I mean, you know, it's it's differentiation. Like, well, you know, we're we're qualified to this and this standard. And like we we know where we're sourcing things from. It's not just a random assortment of electronics. Yeah. So that's I mean, that'll be important for our future just as much as uh, any other strong brand. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. I mean, we're, we're dealing with that with projects we're working on right now for clients where, I mean, the questions come up a few times, which is like, okay, if we create this innovative technology, how do we keep from getting leapfrogged and having all of our hard work benefit a different company? You know, yeah. I mean, it's a real question. You know, part of it that we're thinking about is like, how do we engineer the next generation before this first one comes out? And so, you know, thinking ahead and, staggering you know like the next release so you can sort of leap, leapfrog the leapfrogger has been part of what we're thinking about yeah i mean that makes sense from a from an innovation strategy perspective right i mean the the other thing is kind of to your point of systems engineering like what, what you guys do systems engineering. right yeah. but i mean it it's like from from what we develop it's important that it is not just a hardware innovation yeah. because if it's just hardware you can reverse engineer, you can manufacture it, and you know, you're off to the races. If it's just software, kind of a similar situation. Yeah. If it's a hardware-software system, if you don't have one, you don't have a full product. Yeah, it was interesting seeing those knockoff Roombas come out, though. Right. I, th I, I swear they must have decompiled the Roomba source code. Like, the behavior was so similar. Mm -hmm. So I, I feel like they probably never made their own source, and they probably just de like. I still have like an iLife, you know, <laughs> V five knockoff Roomba. Well, I bought I... my parents the real one, and then I cheaped out on my own because I wanted to save money. But you know, you don't want to be perceived as a cheap gifter. Well, so... well, now you have to bring them together and put them both into the same room, and. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got them like a, a bunch of generations later. I'm still running the old crappy one. Mm. I got them like a much newer, nicer one because I had a good, you know. It was a good month. Year, and I, yeah, it was a good month, exactly. <laughs> I you know, wanted to get something nice for my parents. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it's not, but, but, but is it the Roomba that curses at you? I didn't know they did that. I, I, <laughs> how much does that cost? I want one in every color. Yeah, I, I think it was just a gag video clip. But the, <laughs> you, you haven't seen this one, have you? I'll, uh, I'll, have, yeah. to, I'll have to dig it I up. I think I've seen the Boston Dynamics one where it's like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> Same thing, picture it with a Roomba. That's funny. Bashing into things. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty good. If they, if they were really smart, they'd get the guys that did the voices for Trello Park Boys to fix it over. <laughs> right. You're, you're talking about the uh, the spot video that they overlaid of like the with with, with the the manipulator grabbing the door like ah why why are you hockey sticking me Dave <laughs> stop doing that <laughs> I'm trying yeah. to walk over here that's the one <laughs> yep now now the question is which video got more views that or like the multi billion dollar acrobatic stance number videos that they've put out. <laughs> I feel like the acrobatic stance ones, like, were, like, almost, like, you just don't give a shit anymore because it's, like, you know, they're... Power overwhelming. Yeah, I think that was it, right? It's just, like, eh. Well, and, like, and like it was so over-edited, you're, like, ah, it's not even... Like, like, I like they when they show the outtakes. The right? Oh, have have you seen some of the outtakes of no. the earlier ones? I mean, it's, you know, it's all about keeping it real, which is tough with all this marketing yeah. work that, that companies have to do, right? But what I'm attempting to do with the podcast. <laughs> marketing? What, what are we talking about? Oh, keeping it real and Right, right? Yeah, <laughs> no, but... I, some, all of the above. Right? I, I don't know if they did it with the later ones, but the earlier videos, like, they showed the, you know, Atlas making the perfect trapeze move. And, like, 
oh, okay, that's impressive. And then they showed the outtakes of like it just slamming into things, failing time and time again. I was like, oh, so that took 150 attempts to get that one really nice looking one. And that's probably an order of magnitude off. But at least I got to see some of the failures, right? And I mean that 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 makes the that makes the victory more impressive. To yeah. your point of like, oh well, it's just it's just too good. We've all screwed up. I mean, like a lot, you know. And, and anybody that hasn't either isn't trying or is lying, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, t- took uh, took a while to get to where where we're at with Ecto. We've got room to go, but it's, uh... I like the dog leash system. Like I'm just thinking about that now. <laughs> I, I can hear uh, some of our advisors yelling, why did you share that? Why is that the thing? <laughs> you want me to stop referencing it? <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's innovative. It's, yeah. you it's know, clever. It, it, it's that balance between, like, what are people looking for? Do you, it's actually kind of how we've structured our new office space is there's kind of, oh, you know, you're, you're here to have the equivalent of a home consumer experience with the product. You know, well, welcome to your living room with the boots. So you just have like living rooms set up at the office. Yeah, we're, we're still setting it up, but that's like that first section is like living room, right? Nice. And doing experiences there. Just a couch. Right? A couple couches, nice rug, nice. TV. Uh, the rug's probably good from a, honestly, like just a seeing how it handles the, you know, the mushy carpet perspective. Mm-hmm. We were we were doing some of that testing uh, earlier today. So far, so good. But we'll... I feel like the edge of the rug would screw you. Yeah, well, that's why your rug just has to be big enough. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so having like you know the that kind of area, then the like uh, you know meeting table, sort of like conference space, and then as you get progressively further back, now you're kind of into R and D land. And like, you know, that's where the drill press and boots in various states of assembly and, you know, the, the, the dog leashes and the truss, like that all lives back there. And it's like, are you here to see how the sausage is made or do you want to see the vision of, you know, how this is a consumer product? Which is why you set it up in the order that you did. Right. You, yeah, you know, you can, you, you, you can choose to go as far back as you want, but if you want to stop here, yeah. <laughs> if this is what you're here for. That makes sense. Right? And, you know, to the point of talking about stories like that, like from an engineering perspective, it's, you know, we needed a safety system that either didn't exist or if it exists, probably costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yep. It's it's an application use case like fall arresters in construction. They're designed to handle really long falls. You know, you're, you're up on the roof and you fall off of the roof and it needs to stop you before you hit the ground. But you can still fall like 20, 30 feet and be fine. <laughs> when you're testing with our boots, you can't fall 20, 30 feet and be fine. No, like, right if, if you're that high up, you're in trouble already. <laughs> 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 Which was one of the questions that we got at Jitex a lot. Oh, do these make you fly? We're like, People ask you that? We can make you think that you're flying. <laughs> <laughs> Is that in Dubai? Yeah. <laughs> Well, they, they've got a very, uh, very nice blue or green glow to them, and if if you're if it, if the lighting you is low enough, you see like works. gap lights and then yeah. shoe, and you're like, huh, flying boots. <laughs> yeah. Well, the kind of tech people are showing with flying cars, I could see right? somebody going. I mean, that it, direction. it's like the, the flying car is like fifty feet away. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a far walk. <laughs> nice. That's cool. That must have been fun. No, it was good. What's I mean, it like over there, like in, in UAE? Like it seems like they're throwing up like a ton of buildings. Like Construction like, is crazy over there. It seems like a wild startup scene. Like, I don't know, just like crazy money mm-hmm. is the vibe I get from my vantage point in Pittsburgh. Yeah, no, I definitely uh, a lot of vibe of that. I mean, the, the growth that they have there is just tremendous. But, but I have to say, like... Uh, uh, honestly had some concerns going over here like hey you know americans we don't know what your cultural norms are like we don't want to get in trouble we don't want to insult people like like you'll be fine just nice. <laughs> you know it's it's a modern modern city international travel like we're we're, we're used to this we we get yeah. it just come over here and, and they were right i mean it frankly a lot of times felt like we were in the u.s 
And then we'd see some Arabic script or people in traditional garb and we're like, oh, oh, I, no, no, we're, <laughs> we're in the, the Arab Emirates. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. that, that's a surprise. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, honestly, being at, at Jitex is like being at CES. Like the, yeah, the awesome. people coming by were, were a little bit different, but uh, very, very global, very yeah. Tech interested, focused. I mean, the the only Arab country I've really spent time in, I guess, has been Morocco, and have I, not been. It's fun. You should go. It's nice. great. And and like the dollar goes so far there, you've got like ten to one buying power. <laughs> oh boy! So for, yeah, for not a lot of money, you can you can have a lot of fun. Yeah. And so um, that was cool, but it was it was the biggest culture shock was just some of the I guess the cultural like the fact that like during Ramadan like. People were asked, locals were asking me to buy them liquor, like grown adults were like, can you buy me some booze? Cause I can't legally buy it as an adult during Ramadan. And so. Would, would not have expected that, but that makes sense. Yeah. That, that must've been really weird. Yeah. And so I felt like I was in high school again. I was like, right? oh, buy me some booze. Like, I don't care. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. No problem. <laughs> Happy to do it. Cultural norms, yeah. right? Yeah. And then like, there was one really, I had like this, Hogwarts Express moment where I was on um, a train from like Marrakesh to Casablanca and um, there was this engineering student from the Institute in Rabat which is like the capital there mm. and I, he was like teaching me like so they speak French and Arabic um, and English and gotcha. I speak a teeny bit of French and no Arabic and pretty good English I think and so um, basically this Kid and I were hanging out, and he was a mechatronics engineering student, which is the subject very close to my heart, and uh, yours as well, I think. And so he was Definitely. teaching me like different French words for different engineering concepts, not nice. Tom, the American, or the English words, rather, huh. the American words. <laughs> <laughs> like pneumatic America. versus, like, I think, plumatic. I, I don't know, there were like, some interesting ones. Huh. And then when the sun went down, it, it was like, um, that's when you could break the fast. So this, this motherfucker broke out like a garbage bag full of just pastries. So, you know, there were, <laughs> it was so much fun. And it was me and him. And, it, okay, so go back a step. It was $8.50 for a first class or a second class ticket. or we $12.50 for a first class ticket. So I was like, oh, let's go first class, you know? <laughs> So, Splurge for the extra four bucks. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so it was me and this well-to-do student, and then like two accountants from Jamaica, and we're all just hanging out, eating pastries, you know, just having fun together. It was, it was just really a really a beautiful thing. Nice. So, that was fun. Yeah, you were talking about it's the... a much poorer country than uh, <laughs> Dubai. <laughs> right. Yeah. No, yeah, oh, uh, that makes sense. Good time. Yeah, you were saying about uh, languages. So I. Uh, I almost ended up going to TU Delft instead of CMU. TU Delft? Yeah, TU Delft is in the Netherlands. Oh, cool. Right? Do you speak Dutch? I do not. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> not, not in the slightest. <laughs> Consider taking a class in it, though. So, so all their undergrad is in Dutch. Brutal. So I, I, was, I was looking at it, and I'm like, am I going to have to take undergrad courses? Like, do I need to learn Dutch to take a course? Brutal. <laughs> But everybody all the, speaks English in the Netherlands, though that I've come across. Like right, so yeah. so all the graduate courses are in English. I I spent a week in the Netherlands. Everybody but one person spoke English, no Flawless problem. English, right? Yeah. They're what, really good. What one guy in a in a in a shop? Not not a word of English. Yeah. So you know, I I, I wanted a, a sandwich or something I'm like. He's like, <laughs> like, <laughs> hands me the sandwich. <laughs> like, yeah, you, know, awesome. you know, gestures work. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a good conversation. <laughs> it's like one of the few things I can say in French. It's like, donne moi un baguette. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a baguette. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so there's some conversation about uh, je ne sais quoi and uh, joie de vivre last night. <laughs> nice. <laughs> But, uh, awesome. yeah, no, that was, that was so uh, before CMU time. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, could have ended up uh, 
be a Dutch. We're, we're working for uh, a European space agency lab doing haptics and telerobotics. Uh, yeah, that's that a cool, cool lab. Yeah, they're not they're not a bad space agency. Not as cool as ours, but. <laughs> I don't I, agreed agreed but also I don't know that they have uh quite the same uh telerobotic and haptic arms and vests and stuff that this lab has it's, it's okay. a pretty cool lab are they, are they ahead of mass on that stuff then the European Space Agency? uh yes yeah. that's what that means <laughs> so, so the, the kind of use case that they were talking about, to your point of that, right, is that you would actually, like, to minimize the latency, because I mean, it's a control system, it's a bi-directional, it's a bi-directional control system, yep. if you have significant latency, it's going to be unstable. Yep. Some robot arm is going to go through a part of Mars, or somebody's human arm is going to get ripped off. Yeah, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. There. <laughs> right? So the, the way they were positioning it, and I don't know if they've changed since then, it's been nine years since I was there going on 10 was that this would be telerobotic, but relatively short distance that if it was like for Mars exploration, you'd have somebody in a orbiting capsule and you would have sent the Rover down, oh, cool. but you're teleoperating it from orbit. So nice. it's not all the way back on earth and the so you don't have that seconds, delay minutes of delay much. that you're going to yeah. have, but it's still not like you're right next to it. Yeah. With the idea that you could use a haptic arm and pick up a rock on Mars and put it in a sample container and you know, hey, I've got my I've got my rock. That's awesome. <laughs> so it's like an exoskeleton that they're using to control and then when you say haptics, you don't mean like vibrating pager motors, you mean like legit right. force feedback. For, force feedback, yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. That was uh it was one of the things I got to try out at the lab, which was pretty sweet. It, that was actually the first place that I tried uh, an Oculus DK1. Nice. <laughs> was in the Netherlands. And I got balls, but like I actually am a big fan of the European space agency. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking about how crazy that you know. I, like I, I tried VR headsets in the past. I tried a. I haven't tried the DK1 yet. Was it? I've tried the Rift when that was around. So it it was. I, I was shorthanding. It was the the first developer development kit of. The Oculus Rift. Oh, okay. So like the very like not not the like what excuse me I uh this was twenty fifteen. Okay, twenty thirteen we had Oculus is when Rift the, that... is when the DK one came out. So that okay. was probably it. probably what we had. Yeah. So I mean decades ago I company I used to work for. Certain one, yeah. SpaceX. <laughs> 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 But, uh, it was fun. We did the guillotine simulator in our, in our intern housing. <laughs> I, you know, I haven't actually tried that. I've tried walking through all manners of things in VR. That is is disconcerting, but I'm mostly over it to the point that I occasionally have concerns that I will try to phase through solid matter. <laughs> Hasn't been a problem, but, you know. Nice. <laughs> so but, you kind of cross to the other side where you're starting to think you're in VR when you're in real life. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you the the first time in MRSD when I was using one of the the uh, Oculus uh, consumer versions of the product, I was playing Robo Recall in uh, the basement. Like, and and you know when I say basement, this is not. You mean B level. I mean B level. Yeah, I mean the machine like space. I mean a compressor running and like random pipe shaking and stuff. I was in there. I don't know about you, but I still have a compressor in my living room. Like. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm kind of envious. <laughs> yeah, uh, I keep hearing protection. I, I really should buy the quiet one. They're not that expensive, right? But I'm just, it's, it's always a matter of like, yeah, who am I really bothering? Like, yeah. right? But yeah, that I, I think it might have been a height calibration thing because I came out of the basement after playing a couple hours of that game, and I was walking along the sidewalk, and I'm like, my feet are in the wrong place. Like, that, like, I don't know if they're too low or they're too high, but the ground is not in the right place. <laughs> that's wild. Now, that, that's not your typical VR experience, but it was definitely interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that sounds uh, otherworldly. Right? Yeah, I've come a long way since uh, the, the red-tinted view of the uh, Nintendo Virtual Boy. Did you ever try one of those no, out? No, that? Virtual Boy, that's funny. Yeah, so in the... Late 80s, early 90s, Nintendo is like, you know what we're going to do? We're going to make a VR headset. But VR headsets are too heavy, so we're going to put it on a tripod. Wait, <laughs> so what? it's like 
tripod boom, and then like a red laser display inside. Oh Jesus! I might have tried that actually. It was no, not I sharp. I, I might have tried that. That sounds very familiar. <laughs> if you remember just entirely red things instead of a binocular looking thing, then that's... It's just pointing lasers into your eyes? More or less. <laughs> <laughs> that's but, but it's good. I can still read S-K-A custom. Yep, yep, my eyes are still okay. <laughs> that's funny. I think I used it too. I just didn't remember what it was called. Yeah. Right. And then it went away, and then virtualities some, were in the mall. You might have used those. And there was the one that games. I tried. So there, I, I. This is how white I am. Is my parents had a second house inside of a resort that had like this big arcade, and they had some like early nice. virtual reality stuff. Yeah. Nice. And I remember something. I don't know if it was like a giant trackball or what it was, but there was some kind of a like you were kind of constrained by the circle, and you would walk against something, and then. Like it was, it was a big setup. Like they must have paid like twenty grand or more for it. Um, I, I don't know exactly what it was. Did Did you really walk against it, or were you kind of like you walked? Was it almost like you were standing on a giant like standing on a thing, like right? disc? Yeah. And yeah. if you were at one side, like you went that direction. I think that might have been something like that. That was a virtuality setup. Yeah. Th those were probably a lot more than tens of thousands of dollars. Oh, shit. <laughs> <That's fair. laughs> Today's what it would cost to do that now. Yeah, it would be a lot. That's interesting. I, I, it's funny that you mentioned about that sort of thing uh, at CES when I went. It's probably been like four years now. They had some old virtue spheres there. Is a virtue sphere? It is effectively a hamster ball for people. That's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Giant plastic sphere to the point that I can go inside of one, and I am roughly half the height of it maybe a little bit wild. less right wild so, so they, you're, in a, you're inside a trackball right yeah, that's it there's <laughs> probably encoders the same way you have in a trackball that are tracking your motion <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and I, then I, because I'm guessing it's used as like polycarbonate and it's transparent and you've got monitors around if I had to no so they actually they put a VR headset inside of it Okay, interesting. <laughs> so how do you have the umbilical going to the headset, or is it all wireless? If the computer was inside. <laughs> <laughs> so how do they, they, they have how like do they a... power? Like, are there slip rings? Is there induction? Or how the fuck are they... Probably just a battery. <laughs> yeah, makes more sense. It's wild. Yeah, it, it didn't work great. I uh, it, it wasn't designed for somebody my size. I'm... Taller and heavier than average, but uh, it was a moon experience. I had to put my chair up higher than yours and just look about the same height. <laughs> and, and here I am slouching down. <laughs> You're like, ah, oh, you didn't have to set it that low. I'm just going to set my, my weight up here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's this like moonwalking experience, and I'm walking along, and every few steps it would get like stuck, and I would be at like a 15 degree angle. Like, so what do. What, what do I do now? <laughs> like, it's not going. <laughs> so it was, that was just it locking up, like, against friction and the bearings, or, like, against itself. So yeah. if you had two rollers and you're perpendicular, you're, it's good. Yep. Yep. Like, that or they have to put Omni wheels on those rollers, and that would be like, boop, 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 and they probably I, opted not to, and so that's why they get that locking. Yep. Okay, yep. that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not, not to, well, let's say I, I don't have any uh, legal proof of this, but I do believe, <laughs> I, I do believe that these were banned for a I time. Do declare, I do declare. Declare. Yes. I, I think they were actually, they were banned from trade shows for a while because they didn't have any finger protection and uh, people might have fallen while they were spinning and it's, it's effectively a grate. So. Uh, oh God, so you can amputate. Yeah. <laughs> My they added safety devices and then they brought them back. So I, <laughs> they're probably safe now. <laughs> <That's wild. Virtue. laughs> My mom represented a company in the '70s that was making um, picnic tables. So she's a corporate litigation attorney, and she represented a company in the in the '70s that was making picnic tables. Do I need her on my side? What's that? Yeah, I mean, well, I'll, I'll hook you up. <laughs> um, but she. Um, 
was telling me, so they, there was this company called Action Industries in New York, and they just... Quite like, the name? Uh, yeah, apparently, it's like the most coked out 70s, <laughs> like stereotypical name. Right. And so I, I said that to her, too, I, to her face. I'm just like, that is the most ridiculous stereotype of a name. And so... Um, she can neither confirm nor deny. Yeah. And so, <laughs> apparently when she started, her boss was like, we make shit. <laughs> like... <laughs> <laughs> so they just made all this random shit and like one of the things they made was they made picnic tables and um they had an italian contract manufacturer and through no fault of their own they got roped into this indemnity clause where mm. i don't know if you're familiar with indemnity clauses but i'm not a lawyer but uh, the, the italian company indemnified the new york company and so there was an engineering defect, not a manufacturing defect, but an engineering defect mm. where these picnic tables, when collapsed, would amputate the pinkies of little kids. Ooh. And, um, That's rough. Yeah. And so when the law students started pulling, pouring in, my mom's job was to call up the Italian company and be like, hey, guys, you got another one. Click. You know? <laughs> and then eventually the lawsuits became a class action, and I don't know what became of that Italian company, but I'm guessing they're not doing great. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's why I've been cautioned against signing indemnity clauses. It's fair. Yeah. <laughs> it's the cautionary I, tale I always get. Right. I, I will say on the, the flip side of that, I, it, it seems like uh, either my seven and a half year old's head is getting bigger or VR headsets are getting better at handling kids' heads because uh, Gus tried out a, uh, an Oculus Pro recently. The, oh, the new How headset. far have they come now? What's the Oculus these days like? Uh, I have to say the display is pretty sharp in it. Sweet. Um, they, they added a lot of features that when they're all turned on, knocks the battery life down, which is uh, like... Yeah, eh. what you'd expect, I mean. Yeah, it's, it's not surprising. Um, color pass-through is nice, being able to see in color and see your phone when, you know, <laughs> tap, tap, oh, I see the world, tap, tap, up. Oh, I'm oh, back in VR. Slick. I didn't know you could do that. Right, is right. Just a camera? Yeah, so I mean, they do all the tracking with cameras. So there's cameras here, here, here. I, actually, I guess they changed the constellation on the Pro compared to the the Quest. But uh, I mean, it's doing slam for all the, the sweet. Kind so of, just like a visual slam. Yep, yep, for all the environmental mapping, and then they can stitch those images together and give you world view from it. That's pretty cool. Right, and it's you know you've got that must a, have been expensive to make it work with those camera placements. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the new one actually has like two pretty much here. So, oh yeah, that's gotta be cheaper, right? And, I mean, that's what HTC did with the Vive for the longest time for for their pass through is you know two two tiny <laughs> cameras here and here. Yeah, it's that's like you got googly eyes it, right? on your like, face. <laughs> ah, if I were just spending the money though, I mean, like right? you can spend so much coin on software trying to stitch weird fisheye angles together or just with the cameras. Through. I, yeah, it's just I, I will say, ch checking out the artifacts when you have that stitched together version is uh, is is fun for engineers. <laughs> so there's just areas where wait, if you put your wait, finger, wait, wait. you'll start to disappear. Yep, or like it'll it'll warp and like bend up in some weird way. You're like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> that's really interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I feel like I would do that too. Mm, uh, the, the hours of just sitting there going. No, probably not hours. Who who has that much time in our our yeah, lines of sure, business? But, to no, do I mean, that? It's, well, for you, it's research. I mean, you're, you're right. Just, it's practically you're a business working. expense. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, practically, it's straight up business. I still have not beaten off Half Life Alex, though. The uh, Half Life Alex. Yeah. So uh, Valve, the company that made Steam, uh, Team Fortress Two, a bunch of games, mostly the marketplace. Turns out marketplaces are profitable. Who knew? Uh, <laughs> they, they, they made their own headset, the Valve Index. I know uh, about that. Yeah. So one of the big things that they did to promote it, which was, was not effective in your case, but <laughs> you, you may or may not have been in the target market, uh, was to make, based on the Half-Life series, which is kind of their, their older very popular series of games. It's like post-apocalyptic alien zombie. That's the one with the um, the Pip Boy. Well, oh, that's uh, that's Fallout. Fallout, okay. Yeah, the so Half Life, uh, Gordon Freeman and his uh, crowbar. <laughs> I know that I played that one yet. That sounds like it's, 
it, it's it's an oldie but a goodie. Yeah. But uh, they I just love that they used a kiss to build a dream on for Fallout as the as the theme song. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But they uh, they built a, a game for VR from the ground up. Like there's a lot of stuff that they try to do with VR early on. Of like, hey, I like this game, including Fallout Four. Let's port it to VR. That'll work. Yeah. Kind of does. It kind of doesn't. <laughs> but when you make it from the ground up for VR, like it's a really impressive and awesome experience. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, so we, one of our Often demos with the boots is one of, is the starting chapter of Half Life Alex. It has I think ten chapters. Chapter seven has a particularly nasty zombie that you need to get into rooms with, and an elevator, and uh, it is blind but it hears very well. So anytime oh, you make a sound doing a thing, the zombie goes and tries to eat your face. And Holy shit! Sounds I, terrifying. Right. So I, I mean, I've been I've been doing VR stuff for a while. I've seen all kinds of weird, terrifying, awesome experiences, and this is one of those ones that it's like, ah, but it's just too real. Yeah. <laughs> like the the fact that I'm saying that as somebody who can like analytically pull apart a VR experience and be like, oh, so they use that kind of sprite to do that thing, or oh, that's interesting how they did perspective, and they send this thing at me, I'm like, nope. I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> Screw that. <laughs> That's awesome. I'm such a such a you know wimp that like I couldn't even get through like the final levels of Halo like back in the early 2000s. Ha- Halo was, Three is my favorite. Yeah, I would I would puss out with the um, with the flood. The flood, yeah. Mm-hmm. That always that always kind of terrified me. So so picture being locked in a room, in person, <laughs> with a flood combat form. Oh, jeez. That's what this level is like. That's terrifying. <laughs> like, like, we just dropped one into your studio here. <laughs> yeah, screw that. I don't, I don't want to do that. It, it's quite I couldn't even watch it on the TV. I was, I was terrified. <laughs> so, apparently, when you come for the demo, we're putting you into that game, too. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm putting me into that game, and you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll twist your arm. There's <laughs> uh, a way I can make money on it. I might consider it. <laughs> I mean, we record it and... $10,000. Uh, you, 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 you put your screaming self out there on the internet. We see how it goes. <laughs> Nobody's watching that. <laughs> I don't know. You can put on TikTok. We don't. We don't know what TikTok likes nowadays. <laughs> I had a I had a friend who um, was on a private jet, and his uh, girlfriend recorded him like lip syncing Doctor Evil, like spinning around in the chair. Nice. And it got half a million views on TikTok. It's like, how, right? How does TikTok even work? <laughs> I'm watching that. Yeah, somebody at uh, Discovery Day was telling me one of the other exhibitors. He's like. You know, I, I used to be able to put a video up where I sneezed and get like 10,000 views and a video where like I was doing something legitimately interesting get 50,000. Nowadays, I have no idea how it works. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dude, it's so weird. Like, I haven't even done TikTok yet. I'm, I probably should just from a social, but like. We, we, we've tested. I don't uh, like the skin. I don't like feeling like I'm in a Skinner box. Like, I don't like. Right. We've tested a little bit on a related, like we, we, we made a, a practice account, essentially, nice. to see, like, eh, what does TikTok think about the boots? Likes it more than we anticipated. So, That's interesting. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they're, they're shiny, it. right? <laughs> you probably should be on it. Yeah? Yeah, I thought about it for the podcast, and I thought about it for um, just advertising some of the stuff we work on at SKA. Yeah. And... I don't know. At the end of the day, like, unless I can find some kid to run it for me so I don't have to touch it, like, I don't want to put myself near that addictive of a... Right. A yeah, I mean, it's also, you know, who, who's your audience that you're talking to? Like That's it, right? So, like, if, if 70,000, you know, 14-year-olds like it, who cares? I mean, not... if, if each of them collect $1,000 and pull that together... Yeah. <laughs> 
Th- then it might get your attention, <laughs> but yes, <laughs> generally speaking, that doesn't that doesn't do much <laughs> to help you out. Business to business contract engineering services, yeah, right. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, so. uh, going into the consumer space, that's it's more and more that's the, huge. the, the yeah, crowd. That's where you live, so that makes sense, right? Yeah. Have you seen um, Jacob Hanchar, like the way he interacts with TikTok? He's the CEO of Digital Dream Labs. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 I, I haven't seen how he interacts with TikTok. So but he like, I, I know was TikTok TikToking from the from the podcast studio here. Yeah. <laughs> like, how many CEOs do you know that are on TikTok? He's like, hey guys. <laughs> <laughs> He's hilarious. I like that guy a lot. Yeah, he uh, really funny. This DDL was uh, in the hardware space with us for for a bit there at uh, at LA Twenty Six. Nice. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of like a, a second home from folks through from Alpha Lab here. That's what it seems to be. It's like that's where you end up. Well, so they uh, they did a really awesome thing that uh, any alumni would get uh, like a six month. I don't know if they call it a fellowship or what have you, but essentially you they just get it for free for they, six months. They'd, they'd sponsor you X number of desks for free, uh, and then it's kind of like, yeah, you know, do you like it here? Do you want to do you want to stay here and keep working here? And that's actually really clever. So that probably gets people in the door. Yeah, and I, I would say the the hardware space was was kind of like the the hidden secret of it because you, know, you, you walk in and it's got a it's a co working space right which to a lot of people is oh there's a WeWork vibe and you know it's, it's I, I mean the picture of Bill Murray like as a Napoleonic <laughs> general is what cracked me up the most uh, have you seen all like uh, you've looked at all the the, the paintings. That's the one that I really liked. Like there, there was a painting of Bill Murray, like dressed like he's like wearing the little right. mop things on his on his fucking uh, there's shoulders. A, there's that's the, what they're called. There's the Kool Aid <laughs> Man bursting through a wall. That's there's hilarious. like Marie Antoinette using an iPhone. Nice. <laughs> I'm trying to remember. Uh, there's there's, there's the, Sharknado. Sharknado. I never watched Sharknado. Is it good? I, I don't know, but one of the paintings is literally a tornado with sharks coming out of it. Nice. <laughs> Right, yeah. but uh, yeah, it was a good, good place to land, and yeah. uh, we were there for a couple of years, and now uh, it's got the hardware space and the office space all combined, which is, nice. which is a nice way to operate. That makes sense to me. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean we've been operating out of various small shops and, and studios, you know. Yeah. So as long as you can get away with that for right. you gotta gotta do what you can to be agile and flexible right that's it keep, keep costs low <laughs> <laughs> name of the game yeah, for sure I mean a lot of companies don't do that and then they fail so <laughs> I've heard it too many times but yeah. you know cash is king <laughs> yep yep agreed yeah, and I mean you look at like some of the numbers on what you're spending on I don't know I'm trying to think like There's, I'm trying to think what I can say that's not going to get me in trouble. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> you look at recurring expenses, um, and I'll just leave it at that. Yeah. And some of the numbers they add up to is it's just insane when you when you look at what certain parties are spending on certain things over time. Put it that way. Right. Yeah. I mean. Uh... Especially within the tech startup world, right? Yeah, yeah. right. And in the mature company world, and yeah, just you know, all of it, like all over the business world, and and even, you know, when you look at what people are spending on, I don't know, like, um, remember Juicero? Like, <laughs> yep. They, what what do they want? Like six bucks a day for for a juice subscription model. Juice as a service. Juice as a service. <laughs> is that pronounced jazz? Jazz. It's <laughs> jazz. Be jazz. <laughs> I, I want some jazz in my glass. <laughs> jazz in my glass. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I mean, the, the the hilarity of that company. I mean, the, just the. I don't know if you ever see saw the ABV teardown of it, but. I've seen, I think, parts of it, and I've heard... That was always funny. That was one of my favorite ABV videos. Because it, it, it was like a packet of, like, pulp, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then you had to have, like, aerospace-grade robotics like squeezing the pulp out. <laughs> like, <crusher. laughs> right. 
<laughs> yeah, which didn't really need. Like the guy just put it in the vice. <laughs> 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 Or, I mean, I, I think there's a thing that you use to make lemonade, like, <laughs> like a lemon juicer. Like, yeah. you know, can, do, do those not work anymore? Yeah. <laughs> it's the cold-pressed juice. <laughs> like, the fact that we're spending six bucks a packet, like, ad infinitum to, yeah. to have, you know, juice. Like, who the fuck is buying that? And so Apparently well, not enough people. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> we got $200 million in funding, I think. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's pretty pretty wild. Right? Yeah, no, the uh like you're saying about recurring expenses, like there's there there is the products that are over engineered unnecessarily, but they're branded in a way that at least captures somebody's attention. <laughs> Whether it's enough or not. It was a four thousand dollar machine out of the gate to be right? able to make juice. Right. <laughs> And, and that was the bomb cost, right? Well, well, that was the deduction, right? Is that they're selling these at a loss at right. four grand. Right. It's like way over engineered. <laughs> right. Uh, I looked, guess it was like pocketed out CNC machines. Mm -hmm. you know, it, was, it was crazy. Mm -hmm. the, the real question is did they have their own barista? Barista? <laughs> well, I mean, you're, you're talking about recurring expenses. Like, there's definitely that balance. Or like, you could just hire a person. <laughs> <laughs> to make your coffee. <laughs> well, well, I was I was thinking more from the team perspective, right? Yeah. Like, you know, we, we were joking earlier about Silicon Valley show. Like, there's there's a culture in a lot of cases of like, you know, I, well, I'm gonna have like my own private chef, and I'm gonna have like like the. I, I don't know if tech entitlement is a phrase, but when you get silly amounts of money, you start spending money on silly things. Right. And like I, I think there's an awesome balance of you know treating your people well and like making sure that they feel comfortable and but but at the point at which they're like well you know I, I deserve my own space shuttle <laughs> wait what? where did that come from <laughs> <laughs> I mean don't you want to make me happy <laughs> Do you remember the blood boy bit from Silicon Valley? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> just like like the billionaires are getting like blood transfusions from, like. Younger, this is my blood boy. Yeah, this is my <laughs> <laughs> that's a real thing. Like, I... <laughs> the doors on the car need to go like this. <laughs> not like this. <laughs> or like this. <laughs> not like this. <laughs> yeah. Russ Hadaman. <laughs> I put radio on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> not Tres, <enough>. commas. <laughs> Tres commas. <laughs> Tres commas. <laughs> <laughs> Tres comas. <laughs> yeah, that was really good. Yeah. I love that. Too much of that's real. Where he went back, he's like, I'm under a B. <laughs> like 900 million. He's like all depressed. I'm only a 900 millionaire. Like, I'm not a billionaire. Like I don't even remember what car he got. Maybe it wasn't the McLaren. I can't remember what he had, but yeah, he had like a car with the doors open like this, and he was all bummed out about it. <laughs> Maybe he got like a Lamborghini. I'm trying. I'm trying to remember which way the Lamborghini doors the go. The Lamborghini doors. I think, yeah, they there's like doors too. Maybe it was a Ferrari. I think Ferraris. You might have gotten a Ferrari. Yeah. <laughs> it was like it was still. Oh, a so sad. Car. <laughs> <laughs> Your car's only three hundred thousand dollars. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have you ever driven a Tesla? I have. Those things are pretty nice for the money. I mean, like, I feel like that's kind of an interesting middle ground. Mm hmm Ironically, one of my very area friends has one. Uh, he used to work at Apple, and uh, it's like, you know, why, why don't you try driving this on the stretch? They uh, they do accelerate. They really do. I, um, I was in the Bay Area uh, a few years ago, and a couple of people let me drive their Teslas. <laughs> How is it that this is the common story? <laughs> yeah. One of them put it in ballet mode, and I told like a VC buddy, and he's like, "Oh, he must really not trust you." <laughs> That's you're, rough. you're a dick. Uh, person whose name I won't say on the air. <laughs> now, I I have to say uh, that. So th this buddy of mine also has. I don't know if he still has it. Porsche, Porsche nine eleven. My uncle just got one of those, which is weird because we're Jews. <laughs> <laughs> there's that. There's that. <laughs> but uh, one of my few uh, car pleasures in life, uh, there, there's a company, Extreme Experience, 
that does like essentially track days and oh, you, cool. you, there, there's an instructor in the car you get three laps around a track in you know, some some high, high performance car and they've got like uh, the Audi R8 they've got oh, McLarens cool. Lamborghinis like yeah. all, all those kind of cars and the, there was a Groupon or <laughs> <laughs> so, so, some some deal. Time this comes across your desk, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've done a few of them, as uh, you know. Uh, apparently, I have this thing about fun experiences that move you. I, yeah. <laughs> this one was going forwards, not backwards. Nice. <laughs> the, much much faster, right? The uh, the nine eleven GT three on on Pittsburgh International's racetrack. That, is, that was the most fun of those experiences I had. Now, it's not the car that, ex that you know, has the highest top speed or it's the most horsepower. Car, so I feel like that's probably where a lot of that comes from. It, it is so agile and sporty. It, is, it was just cool. so delightful to drive on that track. I, I did an Audi R8 the same day. It, the Audis are fun. I, I test drove an Audi S4 or it, S7. It sounds like and it feels car. nice. Well, it's a dual right. turbocharged V8. Like, they're, they're badass. Right. Right. I felt weird buying a German car, so I ended up with a Lexus. But I mean, I I, Iron Man had one. I felt my like I needed been, to, to try it. My brother's been busting my balls about like all the Nazi involvement. He's like, "Don't buy a German car." I'm like, all right, fine. They're so well engineered. I guess it'll bankrupt me in maintenance. I probably shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the trick, right? Yeah. And I've got a Ford Escape, so you know, there's that. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll put the hammer down when we're heading back in my car later. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And this is how Spencer gets arrested on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Assuming uh, we've metabolized the alcohol, of course. I'm of gonna, course. We're going to Uber if I haven't. So. Well, this, this is tea, right? Yeah. No, this is whiskey. <laughs> Trick me. <laughs> <laughs> you got me. <laughs> I had this ex who would go, I tricked you. <laughs> it's, like, it's really funny. Right? Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it, was, it was cute. <laughs> but, um, yeah, no, I mean, the 911s, like, I, I don't know. My one uncle got one, and it definitely was fun to drive in. Like, they're, they're sweet cars. I can't, I can't fault it. Yeah, on, when they do the GT3 mod for the track, like, <laughs> the car goes from here to, like, <laughs> Still rear wheel drive, I take it. Yeah. Um, yeah, what's yeah. the horsepower on it? Like, what's it? Well, I'm trying to remember. I feel like uh, ballpark seven eight hundred. Holy shit! So, somewhere around seven. So that is like Audi RS eight territory. Or... Yeah, but like you said, a a, li a pretty light or RS7, like Audi RS territory. Yeah. yeah. That's that's wild. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, those things are cool. I um. I don't know. There's this one, um, I think it was like CW Automotive. I might have it wrong, but there's this one car dealership in Pittsburgh that's, I just had such a blast test driving. I want to give them money, but like they're all just totally impractical cars that they've got. <laughs> like it's, it's just ridiculous. Like they're like Audis and like they've got like a Maybach there and they've got a Ferrari 488 and like just crazy cars that are not at all practical, but like seem like a lot of fun. A few Bugattis just sitting in the I showroom. I must have test drove. <laughs> like, I don't know. Like they, I, I was trying to buy, like, an old Lexus limousine. And so I was looking at, like, a LS460, which is, it's like, it's basically a limousine. It's like, um, it's got, like, real wood paneling. And it's, um, it's got, like, a little, like, barrier that comes up in the back. So you can put a partition on the driving nice. behind it. <laughs> And, um, Proper plus, limousine. Yeah, it's it's got some cool features. Like it's it's got a lot of gadgets. But is it like the one out of Men in Black that uh, goes in the tunnel and can fly upside down? It can't fly upside down. But it's got a four point that an option? six liter V eight, and um, I thought that seemed like fun. But then you put the put the hammer down, and it the transmission's not geared for speed. So it's like, oh, you want to go fast, and it almost feels like there's a non-existent turbo stolen up. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, ah. This car is a good idea, and then the other thing—it's all is, about smooth, right? Well, not they're, fast. They're apparently very expensive to maintain. Mm. So you know, in addition to that, like I, I asked a technician I know at a local Lexus dealership, I'm like, which one would you rather have? The one that I got, which is the um, GS350, or the um, LS460. And both of them are like you know, like ten year old, you know, like out of—they don't make either of these models anymore, but you know, 
Right. <laughs> trying to save some coin. And so uh, the guy's like, well, the GS is, uh, the parts are three times cheaper, and it's way easier to work on. I'm such a cheap bastard. I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to get the GS. <laughs> Easy decision. Yeah, plus it, like, it feels sportier. Like, it's, it's faster, and, you know, the, the transmission does what you want it to do when you want it to do it. So, right. Yeah, that made it a lot easier. Yep. And it's like 70% does luxurious for like way less money to maintain. <laughs> for, for three times less pain yeah. in the... Pain, yeah. in the, pain, pain in, in the knackers, the, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Peter? <laughs> a, real, a real owie, bro. A real ouchie. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, I don't know. I'm happy with my choice. I... Uh, it's a pretty good car to me so far. Yeah, I, uh, I picked mine out by searching sportiest SUV. Nice. And the first one was um, some, something in Porsche's line. And I'm like, cool, I am not made of money. So what's next on the list? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the Ford Escape was like second or third. It's yeah. uh, not bad. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes sense to me. It's funny that you're like in the market for German cars, but you keep kosher. And I don't keep kosher, but I'm like, I won't buy a German car. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one or one or two generations removed yeah, at this point. You can't really fault people for like stuff that happened that far that long ago, right? I mean, yeah. if if we want to start doing that, then uh, we're gonna have to look at our uh, our, our space program yeah. and. Uh... Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, we've definitely coasted on Nazi science for that space program. <laughs> That's how it is. Right. I mean, who else is willing to put humans into vacuum chambers and figure out the parameters for a spacesuit? Oof. That's it. That's, that's what we did. I was thinking more from the V2 rocket perspective, but no, you, you, have, you have a fair point. I mean, that's pretty, I'm pretty sure that's the data we use to design all that stuff. Yeah, wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. That too, though, the V2 as well. <laughs> Not to mention, like, everyone we hired was in the V2 program build like the uh what is it the um what, what was it the Apollo mercury program? mercury probably both to be honest well i mean it was mercury then gemini and then apollo i think that sounds because, right because mercury was the the single single seater yeah so that would have been like alan shepherd yeah yeah that's cool yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the russians may have beat us in the space but we beat them to the moon god damn it <laughs> <laughs> There's a bit of uh, a moon race battle royale. I don't. I don't know what you want to. Yeah, yeah. What? Tell me about that. Like, I I haven't been tracking really. I I don't watch the news a whole lot. Yeah, I. I'm sure I'm missing quite a bit, but uh, I think China's got a. Needs to run. (laughs) Right. I mean, uh, I think China's got a rover on the. I want to say they've got a moon rover, but now I feel like they could also have a Mars rover and. (laughs) It could be mixing and matching, but the, cool. the one thing I feel pretty confident about, uh, you know, with uh, the the Orion program. Now, when I was at Honeywell, they were working on the Orion program back then. That's taken. Oh, interesting. That's taken a while. Um, How long ago were you at Honeywell? That was uh, 2008 through 2015 into 16. So, oh wow, you were there a while. Yeah. Did you ever see that uh, that 1920s video? Like I can't remember what it was, but like that silent film about like going to the moon where. Mm. It's like really over the top, ridiculous. I can't remember what it, what it was called, but they had like I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah, where they're showing like they're like loading like a shell into a cannon basically, and then they shoot it into the eye of the man on the moon, and it's like so. So it's spin launch, or, or yeah, spin launch. Yeah. <laughs> well, spin launch is like a centrifuge, Johnson. Right. But like these guys were like these guys were like um, like Saddam Hussein with the giant cannon. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> so, I mean, I guess it worked. I, uh, not really. I mean, it was total right? <laughs> special effects trickery. <laughs> I think this came out in the 1920s or 30s. Yeah. But I, uh, uh, it's kind of funny just to see like the, the similarity between like the science that got us there and the speculation. But also, I mean, you consider they were like decades ahead of what happened. It's not that weird. And then I think there's like a scene with like moon people like chasing around like a bunch of scientists which are basically depicted as wizards in the movie <laughs> hey <laughs> now what are engineers depicted as 
I mean, I, I think they're <laughs> just, I think it's the same thing in that universe. Like, I don't think there's a difference. Confusing, but I think that makes us wizards. Yeah, that makes us wizards. Mm. You're a wizard, Harry. Yeah, you're a wizard, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's so many good spoofs on that on YouTube. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, the amount of uh, sci-fi that has predicted the the future is... No, I mean, Star Trek's really cool from that perspective. I didn't want to like it, because I didn't want to look like a nerd in high school. But then I went to MRSB, and I'm it. like... Yeah, well, that's when <laughs> you, I embraced you, it. You embraced it later. I, I waited until I was in the Masters program. I'm like, I think I've earned the right to enjoy this this stuff. Like, I can watch the Wrath of Khan now, guilt-free. And get my fucking Masters in a box. I can, I can right. enjoy this. <laughs> now, now, I can't watch into... I can't watch Into Darkness, and that has nothing to do with being, of not being a nerd, because it's very much about being a nerd. Yeah. You, you've seen that one? So when, they, when so. they rebooted Star Trek and did the Chris Pine yeah, and Zachary yeah, Quinto. Kind of, kind of dumb. So the, the first one they did, I, I like good. I liked that one, right? Yeah. And then they did Into Darkness, which is Wrath of Khan, but like they flipped a couple parts and a couple lines, but everything else is Wrath of Khan. Like, the needs nope. of the many no, outweigh nope. the needs of the few. Did they have that line in there? I don't know if they had that one, they but they definitely been, had the... Been you, know, I, I, you know, I you know, I will forever be your friend. Oh, jeez. <laughs> 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 but they switched the fact that it's Kirk and not Spock dying in that. So Kirk died? Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> but it's like, come on, guys. Like, you, you just did all of this work... To reset the whole like narrative universe. That's what happens when you have movies designed by committee. <laughs> you get the zebra. Is it... <laughs> no, you just get the lazy screenwriting that's you know, safe because it, it's. I think it's like less of a risk to play the um, nostalgia card than it is to do an original idea. Yeah. Like I don't know. And it's if you're looking at it from an actuarial perspective of like how are we going to recoup our nine hundred million dollar investment or whatever they spend. You know, it's like, right. sorry, that's a lot of coin. <laughs> Can't take too many risks. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's fair. Disappointing I, nonetheless. I suspect that's why they did it. I, I could be wrong. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know that anybody's really talking about that. the Wrath of Khan is like one of the greatest. Like, it's so good. God! <laughs> <laughs> I love that the villain is basically David Bowie. <laughs> like, yes. I, I had a teacher, Khan, in in undergrad, in college. I had a teacher named Mrs. Kirk. And then she nice. married and her name changed to Mrs. Dyke. <laughs> That's her real name. I'm not making this up. I, you know. the, the number of times that we walked yes. into a test. The Kirk or the Dyke family, if you're from the Netherlands, you're okay by me. Right. <laughs> Every time we would walk in for a test in that classroom, we're just like, Khan! <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I get it. It's <laughs> <laughs> pretty cute. I um, I had a high school chemistry teacher that would like, if you were like bright, she would let you just fuck around to know it. Like, I remember we got to um, if you were she put on these movies like you know like the lazy high school teacher thing when you didn't really feel like teaching, she put on a movie, and like the honor roll kids or whatever would just like light strips of magnesium on fire on the Bunsen burners. <laughs> and my one friend Jeremy, who now has a PhD in chemistry and works at the semiconductor fab, lit like an entire strip and it like flashbanged the whole classroom. <laughs> and we weren't allowed to do that anymore after that. The other thing we would do is we would drop pyrophorics into water like during the lunch. So like me and this teacher, I can't remember what her name was, but she was cool. We would like drop chunks of potassium or sodium into like a graduated cylinder with like a half inch polycarbonate shield mm -hmm. and we were just like <laughs> <laughs> so at cornell the chemistry department used to do a thermite demonstration so this was in ithaca i was in ithaca high school so i would have been right down uh, the street right there me. just right yeah. there <laughs> <laughs> they used to have a thermite demonstration. Oh, dude, They're no bridge. longer allowed to have a thermite demonstration. <laughs> <That's fucking laughs> the boring. number of like lecture desks that they burned straight through, <laughs> and the number of times that they more or less set the lecture hall on fire. <laughs> They're like, you know, the cost benefit is just not working out in our favor. We're not doing that anymore. <laughs> dude, I, my first job was when I was 14 years old in like 2004. I was uh, IT in the chemistry building at Cornell University. Nice. Yeah, they, they had this freebie pile where there was glassware. We could just grab, you know, just 
different labware and take it home with us. And I had this one coworker whose like granddad was like a Nobel laureate in chemistry. He's like, oh, I can use this for my double displacement reactions. He's like a 15 year old kid, <laughs> like super bright. <laughs> right, I mean, <laughs> a future uh, Nobel award winner. <laughs> I think he's like, I think he's like a construction worker now. Like he hasn't. He hasn't and done future like Nobel award, <laughs> <laughs> future Nobel laureate. <laughs> There's still time. Super bright kid, though. Super bright kid. <laughs> yeah. Wonder what he's up to. I should get a hold of that guy. There's, I was gonna say there's LinkedIn, but I don't know if that's how. Uh, <laughs> maybe I'll look for him later. I doubt he's on there if he's doing what he was doing last time I saw him. But maybe. Mm, never know. Not on Facebook anymore. I deleted my account. But yeah. that was fun. I think it was weird. Um, I don't know. I, I have a love hate relationship with it. I'm barely on any form of social media. I mean, there's there's definitely the time element, and to your point, uh, it's, it's meant to suck just, your hours. Yeah, exactly. Right. I've got plenty of things that, that that are worth me doing that with. That's right. Right. Like I think I told you earlier today. Like I had a lunch date cancel, and I was so grateful just to be able to spend the time on systems engineering. And I was like, ah, sweet, time to earn some money. <laughs> like, Demi's watching this and going, "Yes, Spencer. Yes, give in to the systems engineering." <laughs> Demi, whose last name I still can't pronounce. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going to try. I don't. I don't need to offend him and, and and his entire family. Him and I worked it through. Like last time I saw him, we were drinking. So that's what I'm going to blame for not remembering. I'm sorry, Demi. I love you. You've been a mentor and a friend to me, and I appreciate you very much. <laughs> so. the, the systems engineering king of MRSD. Yeah. <laughs> he's a cool dude he definitely influenced me a lot i think like he's he's the one that made me really want to be a systems engineer and you know realize just the, how awesome the field was and with uh with me and demi because i had worked as eight years as a systems engineer at honeywell <laughs> it was like huh yeah, so uh you know, what, what What doesn't quite work for you in the systems engineering world? You think, well, these five tools are broken in this way. I'm like, cool, so these ten tools are also broken. What are we going to do about it? He's like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Try something thing. else? <laughs> yeah, he would say that. He'd be like, yeah, I don't know. How's life? <laughs> Let's go over here. <laughs> but guess they are, they are broken, but use them for the homework anyway. We'll use the real ones later. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's, he's not a bad dude. I mean, oh, he's awesome. Right. <laughs> well, I'm like, I don't know, I feel like I'm still kind of channeling him a little bit in my work, you know, where I'm just yeah. like, this doesn't belong in a physical architecture. That's definitely a functional architecture thing. I was <laughs> 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 having this argument earlier today at work. Right. Have you uh, you figured out how the the lands of UX and systems engineering work together? Interesting. I mean, I think so. Like, I've definitely been on projects with UX and systems engineering elements. I mean, they're they're similar, but they're just like I mean, they're both like pseudo engineering. Like, <laughs> right. I mean, it's all about channeling like customer requirements and implementation requirements, voice of the customer journey, like. But but a lot of the they're almost like different ways of achieving similar goals, but like they're different. Like they right because the systems engineering the abstracts yeah. all of the customer elements and like well, there's like there's systems engineering it. stuff I'm doing now though where I'm like we need a UX person to do this correctly. Like there's certain things where you're like this is a user interface that we're specifying here. We need a proper designer to work on this part of the project. Right. Like I look at UX the way I look at like electrical engineering or firmware or mechanical engineering or software it's like it's it's got a place i mean systems engineering is the same like they all have a role i mean systems right. engineering i think is kind of overarching which is <laughs> but uh but 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 the last time that you implemented a uh a pcb assembly with systems engineering well no, nothing actually showed up <laughs> yeah that's it oh, and you can't implement shit with systems engineering. <laughs> that's what i'm saying <laughs> yes i 3d printed something with systems engineering what yeah. was it air yeah it's powerpoint <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, 
But you can do a very detailed description of how somebody else should implement something. That's it. You're telling people how to do their jobs, which I love. <laughs> Isn't that literally your job description? <laughs> That's a big part of it, yeah. I, I, I like to say I'm a cheerleader for engineers. That's I like that. Nice. I like that. It's uh, uh, you, you know, there's there's that whole like servant leader uh, thing as well, and I, I love the description where it's like, look, you're not a servant. <laughs> You're a servant leader. Like, well, what are you talking about? It's like, effectively what it boils down to is lead by example. Yep. Right? You have to. You have to be willing to pull the same long hours as everyone else and suffer the, I mean, like, to quote, you know, whatever, like, military, you know, bullshit. Like, you have to be willing to suffer the same hardships as the rest of your folks. Or right. Nobody's going to respect you or do what you're saying. And so, like, if you're not willing to, you know, deal and suck it up and do the same work on the line as every other person, then you're never going to get anything done because nobody's going to respect you and work hard to accomplish the goals. Right. So, I'm with you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, kind of similarly, it breaks down a little bit from a specialty perspective, but, like, being able to have implemented something as an engineer and then step back and be the project manager and have, like detailed out the schedule and then step back from that and be the person that is like getting the fundraising to build the team to do the thing like to to start at like the implementation level and then progressively back up to the like executive level but be able to say like no no i understand <laughs> right the, the empathy i i understand yeah. why this is a really painful thing to implement as an engineer yeah but this is what the customer needs. Like, yeah. <laughs> it's going to suck. <laughs> I understand why it's going to suck. But yeah. People <laughs> you know. appreciate that, though, I think, when you can empathize with their pain and feel their pain to some extent. Like, I don't know. People appreciate that a lot more than just do it, you fucking nerd. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy. Yeah. Why, why can't you just do that? It, exactly. Or like, you know, like, I told you to do it. Obviously, it, it should work. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, but you understand. I mean, that's that's honestly one of my biggest strengths is having empathy and understanding different people's perspectives and where they're coming from. Because I don't know. I don't have much going on aside from my relationships. And I mean, yeah, obviously, I'm highly technical and all that. But I feel You're like telling me about the systems you, engineering work. You can <laughs> only do so much as one person, and so right. Really, if you want to accomplish anything of magnitude or scale, you have to be good with other people, and if you don't understand where someone's coming from, you're not going to be good with other people. So like empathy is at the heart of all of it, I think. Yeah. Kind of rambling, but no, I mean, uh, you know, kind of related to that. Like I, I think recognizing that and then recognizing that we're always learning other perspectives, right? Yeah. Like I, yeah. I, I, I kind of come in assuming that I don't understand somebody's perspective and I need to, like it's going to be work to, to get there. Yeah. Right. Which, yeah, that, that I'm not making assumptions about somebody it takes more time and, and effort, but uh, you know, it's well, like we're, we're always learning technically, we're always learning sure. like interpersonally. Well, a big part of like my job as a, as a contract engineer is spinning up on new projects and domains that I haven't been in before, or like spinning up on a project with really, really deep tribal knowledge mm -hmm. where I'm maybe new to the team and so are the people I'm bringing with me. Yep. And it's a tough situation. I mean, it, it. That's what makes it interesting. There's a product recently that we started on, sort of project, where it took 30 person hours, like per engineer, to get onboarded, which isn't. I mean, that's pretty good, but it's also not an insignificant expense. I mean, it's. Yeah. I mean, if you're talking full time, we're talking less than a week, right? But. That's that's not. What full time person gets up to speed that fast though? I mean, that's nobody. nobody. Everybody takes six months. <laughs> so. And I was assuming that you were talking about like not full time on no, a project. No, these are all mercenaries on my team. You right. know, or we're we're contract engineers. Wait, are they gonna are they gonna drop out of the vents? Is that the kind of mercenary we're talking? About? No. Ah, no, I mean, no, no good. Depends on the job. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I seem to no. I haven't checked. No, I, mean, I think I you're think the one that wants to lock me in a room with the zombie, Brad. <laughs> That's fair. I mean, how do I know you don't have one in, in, in the tunnels there? I mean, it's been showing tremendous restraint if I did. <laughs> <laughs> you sir are the best behaved zombie I've ever met. <laughs> I 
now you got like the little kid in me that's afraid of the dark. <laughs> I just have to find the light switch and flicker it on and off a bit and see how it goes. I will murder you. <laughs> You're totally going to smash that bottle and <laughs> shank me with it. No, I love you, man. <laughs> we'll see when I flick the light switch. <laughs> right, I may change my mind. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, 30 uh, engineer hours like that. If you're talking five hours a week, six six weeks, like yeah. that, that's that, that's a so lot. We did of time. it in two weeks. So two we, okay, so yeah, like fifteen. We, we spent ten and twenty. Okay, okay. Yeah, and so, that's fast. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if if there's a lot of tribal knowledge like that, could be. Bottom. Yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're pretty good at what we do. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's why we're here, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, thanks. Um, I mean, there was another project we did where it was two and a half months to do what was supposed to take an individual contributor 18 months. And I've told this story so many times now, but I'll tell you anyway. I think I might have told you this one. I've definitely told it on the podcast. Sorry, people that are listening that have listened before. But we got pulled in. Uh, we had three months left on the clock to deliver something that was supposed to take an IC 18 months. Um, I brought in seven folks, and uh, we did it in two and a half because by the time the contract was negotiated, we'd spent two weeks. So that's all we had left. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm still really proud of that to this day. We came in three and a half percent over budget, and I think we needed to add a week to the clock. But so we might have we might have done it in seven weeks, not six. But pretty good yeah <laughs> so I, I don't know I mean I, I know it's maybe not like the most easy business model but I've, I've sort of enjoyed being a firefighter when you know like people need help yesterday and they know that you can solve it but you're not the cheapest <laughs> so it's like... well, I mean it, not not with the uh, the monetary side of it, but that was a lot of the work that I, I did at Honeywell. That was that was certainly the interesting part. Is like uh, once once the seven eight sevens were flying, like if there was a, a grounded plane because you know it said oh well uh, you know, there's a problem with with uh, an ail rod. You know, I was one, one of the key people that would troubleshoot that kind of stuff, and that that kind That's of stuff awesome. is you know be, be being the tactical team that comes in and. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's highly tactical. I mean, that's right? that's a lot of what it is. And, right. I mean, and strategic is everything that's that positions you to be there to be tactical. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but when you get on the ground, it's all tactics. And so, yeah. Yeah, I'm with you there. And yeah, I, I enjoy tactics quite a lot. Like that's that's fun for me. Like yeah. straddling uh, Pittsburgh Robotics Network Discovery Day and the Advanced Robotics Manufacturing Institute's annual member meeting was an exercise in tactics. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, we we were talking with them if uh, we, we didn't quite uh, manage to fit in to be able to demo both, but I can't even imagine like uh, you, you were you were at both. I was at both. <laughs> <laughs> we had this Ocean's Eleven plan between me and uh, one of our sales guys. Uh, and what it was, was, um, so Tuesday we both did um, ARM, and, and this was, you know, also me onboarding this guy. <laughs> then Wednesday. <laughs> and I mean, that we, was, we, Tuesday was setup day well, we, for PRM. We, right? We'd done some meetings ahead of time. And, and, yeah. But, yeah, so we went to the um, PRN, we set up, ARM started in the, in the afternoon that day. So we set up, uh, my other guy went over, uh, while I was troubleshooting like a TV that wouldn't turn on because of a floating neutral that they didn't hook up uh, at the convention center, <laughs> right? So I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for laughing. That, that, that and my multimeter battery had died on the one I had in the robot uh, Pelican case. And so I, had to, I couldn't figure that out on my own. I had to call in electricians and it was a real pain in the dick. <laughs> so, yeah. Basically... Um, so other guy goes there. Uh, that was not part of the plan. That was something we had to do on the fly just to adapt. Yeah. I got our display working, and then I went over and joined him, and we both kind of hit the networking hour, and you know um, that was it. And then I did breakfast at Air at Aram the next day at the Wyndham. It's a five minute drive to the David Lawrence Convention Center. <laughs> so, 
I jumped in I was my say, car. It felt like they're pretty close together. <laughs> yeah, like a fifteen minute walk or five minute drive. We we looked at all our Google Maps ahead of time and figured out like the distances and where to park and all that stuff. Yeah. And so, um, basically, the plan was both do breakfast at Aram. Um, sales guy goes over to David Lawrence. Um, well, Spencer takes a meeting with a client in one of the conference rooms at the Wyndham uh, at the Aram event. Then Spencer comes over for relief sales guy. Sales guy goes back to ARM at, um, I think I went in at 11.30 a.m. and then he left 11.45 and then the networking lunch was at noon and then he stayed the rest of the day at ARM. I stayed the rest of the day at PRN and then he did the ARM uh, cocktail hour at Mill 19. I did the PRM cocktail hour at David Lawrence Convention Center. And then we both wolf packed the David Lawrence at the very end. And so that was the, was the strategy it's nice yeah highly tactical <laughs> right yeah <laughs> so that was all scripted and, and that went really well and then you know we had to go off script a little bit but because we had the plan we did all right so i feel like it's like that with a lot of engineering a lot of operations i mean sales has been fun to to get my head around because it's really not all that different i mean it's just right you're trying to do a thing. <laughs> it comes down to planning and preparation and practice and, you know, confidence and knowledge. I mean, it's, it's like anything else, you know, so. Right. Just got, got to get your 10,000 hours in. Yeah, I, I might be there at this point. I... <laughs> Tonight? Or, no, just kidding. By now, at salesman but i really am <laughs> yeah. i was gonna say like you, you're getting paid and you're doing sales <laughs> yeah but i've never had a title of, of a sales person right i've always been like yeah an engineer or some kind of engineering manager or a director of some technical thing and so that's, that's what i've always done running the show yeah <laughs> <laughs> Literally. Yeah, it's yeah. fun to have you on. Coming, buddy. <laughs> oh, of course. Happy so what to... else? I, I feel like we're we probably should get to sleep soon. <laughs> yeah, something light. about those those early meetings. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, okay. So maybe we'll we'll end here just to kind of call it. Um, is there anything you want to plug while you're on? I mean. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's always the the good ask. Uh, I mean, uh, we're. Uh, we're likely to be hiring again soon, mostly in technical roles, but also in uh, sales, marketing, biz, dev. Nice. So uh, keep an eye out. Our uh, our website is is getting updated, so the new version of that should be out soon. When can people expect that? The update on that that is uh, well, let's say less than a month. Let's go and call it two to three weeks for when uh, some of that will be out there. But uh, one of the so cool- So you heard it here first, Google yeah. Ecto VR in yeah. January of yeah. 2023. Yeah. <laughs> we'll have a brand new website. And uh, we'll, we'll have Ectopia, the community where uh, everyone who's excited about VR boots can come and check out the latest and greatest. Be That's a... cool. So you're getting a new community on this website too. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's mm -hmm. pretty slick. You know, you get to get to see some inside stuff. As, I definitely uh... need to get your web dev people. <laughs> <laughs> Please hook me up like, right? before the end of the night. Yeah, I mean it'll be it'll be good. Be uh, you, know, you get to see some some epic fails, some epic successes. Bobby sitting there scrolling as as engineering happens. <laughs> no, he's he's uh, he, he is core of the Something team, but to scroll. <laughs> no, he he is the most chill dude. <laughs> but but it's it's definitely a, like culture vibe where he's like super into some story and this like motor test is running in the background. <laughs> he's just sitting there like. And it, you, you might see something on social. It's, Do you guys uh, use ear protection or are you just like, fuck that, that's for bitches? I mean, our stuff's pretty quiet. Ah, like if, right. if we're running a drill press, it's it's noisy. But <laughs> <laughs> our, our stuff is, uh, yeah. That's fair. We're spun. I was working with a buddy on ground effect vehicles when we were in school, like little remote control ones. Yeah, I feel like that's not as quiet. That was loud as fuck. It was very noisy. <laughs> So I'm just thinking, like, <laughs> right, right. Um, I think what else I've done that sounds like a jet engine, but 
never worked on an actual jet engine. It sounds like you have. Uh, I mean, at least uh, the software that, that talks to things that talk to the I've jet engine. factories that make rocket engines a couple of times in my career, but never actually worked on a rocket engine personally. Still time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there's a future client watching this that yeah. wants you to work on a rocket engine. Hire me to do something non-critical with your rocket engine. <laughs> he said super critical. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, I can bring in people that have worked with rocket engines if we're actually talking seriously. But, like, because right. I've worked at two factories that make rocket engines, I know people that work on rocket engines. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a fun life. Um, maybe I'll do my plug and then we'll call it. Yeah, sounds good. So, Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is brought to you by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. SKA Custom Robots and Machines. Thanks for coming on. Beautiful. Buddy. Thanks, Spencer. Thanks, Brad. All right.